All right, guys, we're back again, and it's time to talk about football and everything in between. Like I always say, uh, the opportunity to talk about this beautiful game that we all love is an opportunity that I don't take for granted. Whether we're playing it, whether we're talking about it, we're reporting it, analyz analyzing it, it's always a beautiful game. And there are some people who's giving everything, but somehow don't get the kind of recognition that others get. And sometimes you just feel like, Oh, why is it like that? Why is everybody not, you know, being appreciated? Well, today we're going to touch on a few people, the unsung heroes, guys who really played in this game and they didn't get it. So let me let me start the build up by saying this, that uh, in my time as a football player, I've seen some good goalkeeper for the Nigerian League. Edward Ansa before me, uh, before my time, uh, there is Lemisa, this is Lance Oboko, Andrei Komogbe, the cat himself. Uh, one of the best, one of the most audacious goalkeeper who you can uh, liken to Georgie Campos or Hoge Campos of Mexico is Imama Amapakabo himself. Great guys for those who watch him and for the MPFL fans. Some of people might not know who are these guys that I'm mentioning, but I do know that they were some of the hardest one to beat one-on-one -on -one crosses. What's the attribute of a good goalkeeper? Good at, at anticipation, perfect reflexes, uh, ability to command his goal area and his defense, organize his defense very well. All of those and those big arm save, those uh, life's changing or 15 point giving save through the course of a season a wise man once said that uh, attack will win you games but defense including goalkeepers will win you championship and i want to talk about one goalkeeper but uh, the man here that will talk about it talk about him for us is um, china Achiru. there is a goalkeeper that we used to call arugo monkey i guess it's the only guy who the only black man in this world who um, you can use the word monkey to describe and it will not be seen as racism or anything negative. Uh, China, you worked with him for many years. Talk to us about the Arugo monkey or Chijoki Ijogu that you know uh, for the pleasure of everybody that is here and also the audience, the people that will watch this video uh, for us to understand. And some key moments, highlight some key moments. I mean, you don't have all the time in this world, but you have four, four to five minutes. Okay, um, Ijogo came into national prominence in 1998. He played for a club called Arugo Stars at that time. It was an amateur team that went all the way to the FA Cup, I think semi-final, and they beat a lot of big teams along the way. They had a key player in Chijoke Ijogo called Arugo Monkey because his club was Arugo Stars and they felt in the pussy jumps around like a monkey, Arugo Monkey. There are other, other players like Obi Nan Nodim in that team, some other top players in that team. Now, at the end of that FA Cup run, he was signed by Julius Berger the next season alongside Obi Nan Nodin. And um, Dolphins signed him on in 2004. Son Dirutimi was leaving to Israel. We needed the backup goalkeeper. And at mid season, we went for him. And I remember the coach of Julius Berger at that time telling us this player will destroy you. He's a very good goalkeeper, but he's, he, has a, he has terrible discipline. But we, we needed him, so we signed him on. He did well. We won the league and cup double in 2004. Then he hit us in 2007. At a time when we had just one keeper left, Rotimi was out of the way. Shegolo Ali was out of the way. He was the only registered goalkeeper in our team. We had to play in the CAF Confederation Cup. How does it team, how does it team with about 35 players have only one goalkeeper registered? I just told you that. I just told you now. We had been relegated to the lower division. Now, the goalkeepers on our books, one was Shego Luani. He decided to go back to Rangers because the previous season he was third choice goalkeeper. Not minding the fact that he, he had a license for the Cup Confederation Cup. Um, the other goalkeeper was injured. So it, uh, it was just a juggle left. Was, we had three keepers on our books, but one left, one absconded, and the other was injured. So a juggle now says, You must pay me before I play. That was his style. Wow. A day before he came, he says, My style is not well. I cannot play. And you have to pay him. My mother is sick. You have to pay me. That was his style. So he kept on holding us to ransom, you know. And I saw sports commissioner after sports commissioner paying Chijuke Jogu just to play for us. Because he knew that he had held us by the balls, you know. Aha. Uh -huh. but, but that's just the bad side of him. 
On the pitch, he was one of Nigeria's finest. In 2007, he saved more than 15 penalties in shootouts, not in match, in shootouts. And I'll tell you the most uh, remarkable one was when we Dolphins played in Morocco against Hussein Agada. I've talked about it on this, on this show before. Yes, you have. Right? I guess Hussein Agada, when with the game 1 1 and straight to penalties, he told the sports commissioner, How much do you pay me for each penalty I save? And the commissioner is like, so he was joking. Okay, I'll pay you a thousand dollars per penalty you save. He said, Okay, let me see the money. Commissioner counted five thousand dollars. That's all when you use so he's not a senator. So I'm just I'm calling names. And he says, Let the captain hold the money. He has the money, money what um, God doing, uh, Emma God doing. And the joke goes around to the players. Make on a catch on our own. No. Make, so, sorry, make on a score on our own. No. I'll go catch my own. Out of five kicks, a joke will save four. And that was how Dolphins qualified to the next round. Before then, in the FA Cup round of 32, we played against an amateur side from Katina State. Game ended goalless. A joke saved all five kicks. In the quarter final of the FA Cup, we played against Eimba in the Loring, ended goalless. A joke saved four of those kicks. Semi final. In the semi final against Sharks, ended 2 2 in a way. A joke saved four penalty kicks. Take us to the final. And the final against Rangers ended in a draw at full time. A Jogu saved four penalty kicks. No. So that's going to end because it was no, so confident. That's 21 it penalties. Players, in one... scared of him. Wow. Yes. I remember in the FA Cup semi final against Sharks because the Sharks players are really young. They are really young. And he put the fear of God in them. He gives them the ball and he says, oh, I'm going to waste my time. Oh. Bring that come. I won't catch him. <laughs> wow. Very confidently. Oh, but I don't waste my time. Bring him, I won't catch him. So a job was that good, but the other side of him was the bad side of him. Was the bad side of him. Um, listen, he's one of he's one of the best that have been in goal for Dolphins in my time following Do Dolphins from the Eagle Cement and to Dolphins. He's one of the best that has been in goal for the team. But he's not his other side. It's not what you want to talk about. He, I mean, he really had a very bad other side. <laughs> Well, I, I I don't mind footballers having their bad side for as long as when they get the job done, they get it done very well. Uh, and that doesn't yeah, mean he used that. To get the job done. Yeah, that doesn't mean that when I say that somebody in a court me out of contest, but uh, but you are angry with to see me. No, they are two different things. There's the erratic side of goalkeepers, and majorly some of the best goalkeepers are very very erratic. Uh, uh the one the German goalkeeper is the one that come to mind. Oliver Kahn, very very erratic to the point where. He, he played an exhibition game for children and he saved all the penalty kicks that they were playing. And I'm like, this could be the meanest goalkeeper in the world. But having said that, let's go to Italy. Daniele, uh, there is an Italian who we always talk about. And when people talk about him, they talk about him more as the manager of Manchester City. Uh, the guy who fan the embers of Mario Balotelli, the man who was able to manage and bring out the best out of Mario Balotelli. But at the same time, people forgot, forgot that he was a player. Tell us about the Mario Balo the Roberto Mancini that you know, and some Italians know, but not as celebrated as Alessandro Du Peru, Alessandro Nesta, Paolo Maldini, Paolo, uh, Franco Baresi, Roberto Baggio, the Divine Ponite, and the rest of them. Talk to us about Mancini. Yes. Hello, everyone. So, uh, yeah, Roberto Mancini is probably more, you know, is internationally more famous as a coach than as a player, even though, you know, he's had a brilliant career as a coach. You mentioned the, um, he kind of launched Mario Balotelli. Mancini is, un unlike many other Italian managers, always been brave in trying to launch very, very young players. He launched Santon, for example, who, you know, was expected to have a greater career than what he had. He launched Balotelli. Even as a national team co coach, he uh, he tried to launch some very young players. And yeah, he was successful with Man City, with Inter. He was very successful. Before that, with Lazio, he was successful. But, you know, I think, you know, I don't want to um, overlook his career as a coach, but I think as a player, he was something more than what he was as a coach so uh the, the problem is he never reached you know that international stature that the um 
you know, it probably his potential was, you know, uh, should have allowed him to 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 reach. Um, that's because of many reasons. So uh, he was very one 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 of the reasons was his his character. He had especially when he was young, he was considered a prodigy. So. I think he scored like nine goals in Serie A as a 16-year-old or 17-year-old. And scoring nine goals in Serie A at that time was equivalent to scoring 20 goals today. Uh, defenses were very tight. There were less matches. Uh, but then, you know, uh, he didn't have a very easy character. So he, he often got very angry on the pitch with himself, with teammates, had problems with a lot of coaches early on in his career. Then things changed. He reached maturity under Vujadin Boskov, and he was playing for Sampdoria. He, he won the Serie A title, played the Champions League final, and then with Van Gogh and Eriksson, that's you know where he probably reached his peak as a player. But football in, in those years was very different. I'm talking about the 80s and the 90s. And for example, you couldn't have two number 10s in uh, in a team it was kind of an unwritten rule so at th that time and the time when mancini reached this peak there were some brilliant number 10s in italian football one of them you mentioned you know, probably the best one in italian history was roberto baggio uh, and it's such a shame that at that time the mindset the mentality was playing with only one number 10 because i think today you know what a fantastic couple they they, they would have been the, the you know in the starting lineup of every Italian national team and what a missed opportunity we we had there because Mancini could play as a number ten but he could also play as a center forward as he show, as he showed later on in his career and you know just to give you a sign a measure of how good he was. Uh, with Mancini on the team, he stayed in Sampdoria for, I think, 16 years. And, you know, as soon as he left, because he, he then he signed for Lazio, as soon as he left, uh, in uh, you know, within one season, Sampdoria was relegated. So yeah. they went from going title contenders or almost title contenders to a Serie B team. Right. And Lazio, who hadn't won the Scudetto for 25 years, in his, I think, uh, third year at the club, they won the Scudetto. And they even played as a midfielder. He was so important that Sven Goran Eriksson played him as in, in midfield just to make him play, you know, just to find him a, a position because he was so important and so charismatic. So I think it's very important point is how good a player is individually, but how his presence improves the other players around him. And... From this point of view, I think, uh, you know, facts speak for themselves. Such a shame that is not, you know, is not being, being considered as good as he actually was. Yeah, so in football, there are quite a few players who make the players around them better than they ordinarily are. And these players bring the glue together. Currently in Man City, you could see Kevin Obrania, for instance. And uh, back in the AC Milan days, you have Ricardo Kaká, you have Manuel Acosta, the Portuguese, you know, mag magician. You have Vominia Boban at some point in his career as well. Francesco Totti, yeah. But of all these players, uh, let me go to you, Mario. There's a German player who makes everybody around him good, but sometimes people don't even seem to remember if he plays at all. Thomas Muller. You know, we've seen Klinsmann, we've seen Luda Marius, we've seen Mario Sama, we've seen Stefan Effenberg, as terrible as a human being as he is, but he was a, he's a, he was a fantastic player. Thomas Muller, what's the thing about him that just kept, you know, he's just quiet. Nobody really, he doesn't have the, the press that all that big players have. He doesn't have the noise, the balls around him. It's just there. Talk to me about Thomas Muller and a few other German players who are not really celebrated as their other illustrious uh, countrymen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to do so. And, and Thomas Müller, nobody knows, is an Olympic gold medal winner from the Paris Olympics 2024 because his horse he owns uh, was was winning the gold medal title with the, with the German equipe. So his, oh. his wife is a, 
It's a well famous right, uh, writing, uh, sorry, uh, horse riding competition. Um, she's not participating in the major tournaments because obviously Thomas takes most of the attention and travels most of all. But he's got a very, very stable life. Yeah. And, and obviously he's, he's, he's not known for any drama, no, no uh, dressing room bust ups, no discotheque bust ups, anything, um, no, no other things. And, and obviously, when you look at, at Thomas Müller overall, I mean, he's, he's um, five foot 11, five foot 12, so 185 in, in size. Um, and he doesn't look very talented because his legs are overly longer than, than his body. So his body composure yeah, doesn't, doesn't make him look like he's going to be a, a superstar. Yeah, but he's obviously one of the most decorated individuals in, in Germany. I mean, he won 12 German championships with Bayern. Um, he won uh, twice the, the UEFA Champions League. He won, uh, he's a World Cup winner uh, with Germany. So he's a European champion. So he's, he's yeah, won the club championship. So he's really won a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of titles. But the problem is, obviously, he never, he never moved. Yeah, he's always like an inventory of FC Bayern, and he's always been there, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, never been the most talented players. But when the season starts, he's on the right wing. Yeah, who's who's playing on the right wing? Thomas Müller. Yeah, all the young challengers come into the team. Yeah, trying to being bought by 30 40 50 million euros come in but at, at the end of the day who is playing thomas muller and who is scoring thomas muller so it's a, really um, an incredible talent uh, for me because obviously when you look at his international career 130 games for the german national team 45 goals that means one in three um he he scores um, he's got a lot, a lot, a lot of, of records. Um, and for me, it's like really a character completely underrated. And, and obviously, because he didn't have an international transfer, he didn't make a lot of time headlines. But he's the most authentic player when, when, when there's post-match interviews um, here in Germany and Bayern is playing and, and somebody wants to come to the interview, the, all the journalists, they ask for Thomas Müller because they get the most honest answer the most authentic personality. When he didn't play well, when the team didn't play well, he will tell that the team didn't play well. Um, and he's, he's very known and very authentic in all his behavior. So that's why he's become, in the German public, one of the most recognized, one of, one of the most down-to-earth, one of the most authentic, and one of the most beloved football players, even though he plays for Bayern, which is obviously controversy. But if you ask a fan of Dortmund on one of the most authentic football players, Thomas Müller will be always in, in the top three. Wow. Uh, let's move to Bobby. Bobby, growing up, you know, we we grew up with, first off, our favorite player is a number 10 player. Anybody who wears number 10 is our favorite player. Ernst, Pele, Maradona, Zico, Michel Platini, and all that. Bobby, when you were growing up, who was that player that made you fall in love with football? Mm. Um, the player, I would say the player that's made me fall in love with football has to be Maradona. Yeah, yeah because yeah, those days it was Maradona was the man. Okay, Primary school, incredible. secondary school. Everybody were talking about Maradona. Everybody wanted to be Maradona. Even before people were talking about number 10, JJ, everybody wanted to be Maradona. Though I would say my best player is Pele, but Maradona was the one that got the juices flowing, got us into the game, got us entertained. And which is being controversial too, he brought that aspect to the game and the other side to the game. Always full of intrigue, always always full of entertainment, and he was he was more seen as a a team hero, especially with what he did in the nineteen eighty six World Cup. Yeah, so Maradona was the man. Maradona was the man. Have anybody told you that the face cap really make you look more American than even Nigeria? <laughs> You need you need to add your ES thought to it, and then you become like one of those agents of the basketball player. <laughs> Where is Abib? Ah. Mm, let's go to Abib now. Abib is a kid, so he obviously will have like um, you know yesterday's players. Uh, Abib, who made it happen for you? Mbappe. Eh? Mbappe. <laughs> <laughs> Mbappe is, oh, uh, right. is for my kids. Mbappe is for my kids. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not that young. Gotcha. Wait, I would like to add something before I mention my favorite player. And okay, Mario before you mentioned... add, wait, wait, before you add, what are you wearing? Oh, it's a native attire. Today's Friday. 
Oh, you're looking so cultured, that part, man. You're looking good. Thank you. So I, Mario mentioned um, um, Thomas Muller. Thomas Muller is also one of my favorite players. And really? One, yeah. And then the Germans invented a word to describe Thomas Muller because of the role he plays. They call him Rami Deuter. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, Mario. Is Mario still here? No. Uh, no, Mario is not here. Yeah, Rami Doita, Thomas Muller is very intelligent. He means space operator, someone who understands space, someone who can anticipate space, and someone who can attack space. So, yeah, Thomas, Thomas Muller is also one of my favorite. But for me, I think one of the most underrated footballer has to be like David Silva. And this is because he came in an era where you had like Spain Golden Generation. You had the Javis, you had the Iniestas, you had the Busquets, you had Xabi Alonso. Yard Villa. So we had other players where that you could not fully appreciate who David Silva was. David Silva is so good on the ball. He understands how to play in tight spaces. He can play across like the front three. He can play anywhere in the midfield. He's very intelligent. And because he's also a left-footed player, I'm also a left-footed player. He's very, very technically gifted. He, he can dribble, he can pass. And some of the things that Silva has won, he's also very instrumental in Manchester City. He has won five, four Premier Leagues, two FA Cups, five Carling Cups. He has also won the Copa de Rey in 2008, where he played with David Silva, part of that Valencia team that played in um, that played. And he also went back to Real Sociedad, and he also won the Copa de Rey. And he has won the World Cup. He has won the Euros in 2008, in 2013. And he also scored in the final against Italy. Um, Daniele can also attest to that. He opened like the opening goal against um, Italy in the Euro 2000 and, uh, 2004 final with a brilliant header. So he's very, very, very gifted. He understands like football, like his brain is beyond like his, his peers. And during the documentary where they were doing like City's documentary and Guardiola was doing like training sessions, and whenever David Silva got the ball, that um, all Guardiola could say was like, David, David, do the attacking, do the attacking, because he knows like David Silva can initiate like attacking plays from deep. He's such a brilliant footballer, and I feel like we should give him more kudos and more flowers. He's so underrated, and if he was playing during this time, like this time, I think he would be given more praises and more appreciation. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Quite a few other players for notable mention. Uh, Pablo Aima. Uh, I think Pablo Aima doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Uh, the kind of football he plays. Gaskar Mandieta as well doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Javi Alonso also didn't get the credit, even though, I mean, there were seasons where it was not as consistent as it should be. Another player is Santi Cazola. I don't think he got the, 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 the credit that he deserved for the kind of, the quality of football that he played, as well as post schools. I mean, people talk about post schools and they just may, oh, part of the golden generation of England. I, I thought that his ability to touch the ball, the finesse with which he touches the ball, the way he hits it. I mean, he's a little man. He's a pint man, a, a pint-sized man, a rocket. Yeah, but the way he plays, the technicalities with which he hits the ball is incredible. And another guy, I mean, people say, oh, you talk too much about him, but Steven Gerrard. I think that one of the things about Steven Gerrard that I love is if you ask me today, what is the wing, the position of Steven Gerrard? I don't know. Uh, he could sit in front of the centre-back and hustle the opposition, gets the ball, distribute a pass. He could play it short. He could play it long. He could, you know, do a 360 degrees against the opposition. He walks from the blast of the whistle to the final whistle. He leads. He's commanding, covers every blade of grass. And then other players like Clarence Sidov, who I think also for the kind of titles that he won everywhere he goes. I think Clarence Sidov is the the man with the Midas touch in football because everywhere he goes, he wins the Champions League, he wins something, he makes the team tick, he makes the team better, the way he walk, Edgar Davies as well, even though in some places he didn't do well like when he went to the Premier League. But then, all these players are players that get notable mention for me. Now, having said that, let's switch a bit. There are matches coming up over the weekend. It looks like this weekend is going to be a very, very long one for Arsenal fans or probably the next couple of games, the next three games. Arsenal plays... Um, uh, Tottenham was about 2 o'clock on Sunday and then they play against Atlanta midweek and then they go again away to go play they play against Manchester City it's crazy 
how all of a sudden during the transfer when he felt like, oh, Arsenal have got an of a blue, blue test world squad everywhere is filled up. And right now, Arsenal's just, Arsenal fans everywhere are complaining, oh, we don't have the players to play, we don't have any feeders. I mean, to me, my opinion, I think that this is when a coach will show what he's made of. Because we've seen Silas Ferguson where an entire team is depleted because of injury. We also saw that with Rafael Benitez with zero budget, okay? Recently, we saw him in a podcast where he was saying 20 million was what they gave to him in an era where people were spending 120 million, uh, 80 million, 60 million. He had 20 million to raise that team that went on to win the Champions League. Bobby, let me start with you here. What is the excuse that Mikel Arteta has just been giving a new contract? What is the excuse he's going to give for not winning at uh, three point lane, sorry, white hat lane. <laughs> what is the excuse? And the, the obvious excuse would be injuries. That would be the that would be the obvious excuse. Would it be but acceptable? From what, no, it, it shouldn't be acceptable because from what he has, he should be able to mold a squad that can beat Tottenham. Tottenham are there for the taking. Forget about yes, um, Arsenal is missing um, um the bodyguards. God. They will miss. They could be missing Calafiore, Declan Rice, but they have. They have enough to build a squad to beat Tottenham. I'm not saying that their debt, their debt is the best because they are still lacking. They don't have a striker. They still need another. I think they are still missing. They are still missing another right winger. But the the transfer window is closed, and they had all the time to make all the, to do their shopping. So right now, is this is where you know his um his technical um Ateta's technical and tactical ability comes into play. So he can he can move he can move the score that can beat Tottenham. Tottenham are not they are they are not a solid team to me. They are they are they are they are they leave spaces in behind. Say it, say it. They have, they are shit. Say it. This they are, is not. They are shit. They, they've they've always been shit. They have always been shit. They, they have they have a they have a defense. They, they they keep leave spaces behind. Um, they are not clinical. They have a, a central defender Romero who always gets lost up front. So, um, they are there. That's not, there's no, there's no excuse for Ateta. He has to win this game. This is the game you used to know. If you're serious for the title, these are the games you should win. Bobby, uh, thank you very much for that. But let me go to Abib. Abib, uh, Manchester United played their easiest game. As a matter of fact, it is Manchester United versus FC Taraba, uh, mm. you know, this weekend. That's not like the easiest game. Manchester United mm. loses this game. God forbid, but God doesn't forbid anything. He allows everything to happen. Manchester United loses this game. Should we start typing the sack letter? I think it's sack letter should have been typed like as immediately Tenag finished this season last season. It should have been typed, just handed over to him. Just thank you for what you've done. Goodbye. Gracias. And God bless. Young people are mean. Young people are mean, Sha. <laughs> <laughs> that's when they should have given him the sack but what, whatever he's doing now is just I think he's practically just delaying when he's going to get the sack I think Eric Tanner will still be sacked by this season so this is an easy game for Manchester United they should win on paper knock on wood they should win but we know Manchester United this season they've not been playing well they've not been scoring goals which is very important they've not been defending well and they leave too much space between the attack and their defense, especially in midfield, like Bobo would say, sandwich donut of a midfield. But, you, you, but this is a game where you expect them to win, but we know Manchester United under... We must United. talk about General Ugati is coming. He's playing. 50 million General Ugati, better than Zidane, better than Jesus Christ. The best thing to have ever happened since Jesus carried the cross from Oweri to Cavalry. My United... Really? Now, come on. You, using your words, you would think Ugate is going to start, but I think he's going to. It won't start. It's not starting. It starting. won't start. It won't uh, start. Eric Tenag was asked yesterday. He was like, uh, "What of Ugate? Is he going to start?" He played for Uruguay and basically replied, "Oh, Ugate came in yesterday, while other players came in on Wednesday." So he's already giving hint that Ugate is not going to start against it against South So until they, until they beat him, it. until he loses the game, he will understand. Well, let, me go, it, let me go to Italy. Danielli, what are we to expect this weekend? The whole dust of transfer rumors, this one. Uh, Conte have his man, uh, Lukaku. He's, have, he's, got, he's got his man Friday. What are we to expect from Italy? Inter Milan are still the pace setter. AC Milan doesn't look like they've got it all together. Juventus, I thought, okay, they find their bearing. Uh, Thiago Mota is going to just get them smooth sailing. What's, what's the expectation? 
Yeah, I think it's um it's an interesting uh, weekend uh, because you know uh now the transfer market has finally closed and uh there have been two weeks yes with national breaks but there have been two weeks to for coaches and clubs and players to get their head around <laughs> things. And yeah, it's going to be interesting because I think AC Milan are playing Venezia at home. So Venezia are, you know, not exactly, a, you know, title contender. Okay. So the, they, they have a chance and they can't miss that chance of winning that game. I think otherwise the, the, uh, the AC Milan coach might be in trouble. Um, Fonseca. Um, Juventus are playing in Empoli, which is, um, you know, Empoli are never a big team, but it's always difficult to to make points to to come out of the Empoli stadium with with a win. And uh, Cagliari Napoli is also interesting to see if Conte, you know, can continue with his um, streak that he started after a disastrous uh, first game. And uh, I'm very curious to see what will happen in Bergamo between Atalanta and Fiorentina because, yes, Atalanta might have, you know, might already be thinking about the Champions League, but, you know, they've really gathered too little in the first three matches. You know, I would ex- I would have expected Atalanta to be, you know, there with in, in the top three or four, but they only had one victory and two defeats mm-hmm. and they're playing with Fiorentina at home. So it's, it's going to be a very... Um, testing match for them. Fiorentina are also uh, hungry for points. And Inter are playing in Monza. Um, you know, Monza, the, the past two seasons were a good team. This year, I, I think it's still unclear. They found a very good player in Daniel Maldini, Paolo Maldini's son. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, my guess is that Inter will, you know, will come out of this weekend being top of the league but it's just a guess all right for those of you who are following us on the show for the very first time one fun fact about italia Serie a there are only four players in italia Serie a uh, or Syria a as they call it in italy that have played more than 600 games paolo maldini of ac milan who played between 1984 and 2009 then you have gigi buffon the italian Ancient of these, and then you also have Francesco Totti and Javier Zanetti, the Argentine. Who I mean, you could call him an Italian Argentine or Argentine Italian, yeah. whatever. But let's go to China. China, the Nigerian League returns again this weekend. And uh, where is your piece of the pizza? What is your slice? What part of it is biting you? What part of it is like Amoniki lost his first game at home, three goes to one. Uh, Eimba are playing at home this week. Okay, they're playing away on the continent. Sorry, but I mean, where is it for you in the Nigerian Premier League? Uh, two minutes for me, it has to be for Sarkot, right? Um, Rivers United against Atlant, uh, that, that would be the Emmanuela Munique thing. Um, it'll be second game in charge at the club, lost 3 1 at home to Eimba. Trying to make amends in Port Harcourt against uh, Rivers United. So that's where my mind would be. I don't have to travel too far. Um, I was in New York last week and I think I, I need to take a little break from traveling. Now, there will also be Remo Stars at home to Sunshine Stars. Uh, Remo Stars have always finished in the top three, at least in the, in the last three seasons, they finished in the top three, which is not bad for a club that is new in the division. So I, I have one eye on Remo Stars. They have good organization, they have a good pitch. Uh, they have a lot of good things uh, going for them. So, reverse United in Padakot against Heartland. I'm watching right here at the stadium. And of course, I have one eye on Remo Stars uh, versus uh, Sunshine Stars. All right. Thank you very much for that one. In the Premier League, let's not forget, there are 50 teams that have played in the Premier League since the Premier League started in 1992. Dun Richard scored the first ever goal in the history of the Premier League. For Southampton, if I'm not mistaken, or is it Sheffield? No, I think it's Southampton or Sheffield. No, Sheffield, and uh, that has kept everybody going and glued. I wish that Nigerian League can be that exciting as well. Talking about traveling, uh, the diary of a vagabond. What is the timeline of that for us, China? When is it going to be released? 
we are in September, it will be released in November. It's going to be out on Amazon first. After the Amazon launch is done next month, then probably on the first week of November, uh, the Nigerian launch will be done. So you those when are... I release a thousand times of the... what? No, no, go ahead. When I released a thousand times on the same road, it was done in the first week of November 2020, just after COVID break. So I'm doing an October launch for Amazon, then the physical launch in Nigeria for November this year. All right, Bobby, let me ask you this before we sign off. Um, if you have something to change in football, in the rules of the game today, what's that one rule that you will change? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the handball rule. Because it's too, it's, it's too, it's too hazy. It's, it's not clear. It's not clear. That's, I think that is one of the most controversial rules in football right now. Not even the offside, the handball rule. That's the uh, one I, I would Abib, change. Abib, which rule would you change? Yeah, I think the, 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 it will also be, I think I will agree with Bobby too. Also the handball rule. Ah, and first also time on, I too agree on something else. Yeah. Daniele, what would you change if you have uh the powers to change the rules of the game? I would limit VAR and give the the coaches the opportunity to challenge like they do in the NFL. I think it's mm. uh, that would be an idea. Wow, that's that would that's be interesting. A, that's an interesting. You, you want to Americanize the sports? No, no, yeah, no, no, to be interesting. It's, 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 it it would be interesting because Ateta would have challenged that red card to. I mean, there's a, oh. a whole lot of things that you will be able to challenge. I think Imagine a... Mourinho. Ah, Asad Wenger. Please. Yes, but uh, in the NFL, they're given a limited amount of a challenge. A limit, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a limit amount. So you know it's like to tennis use, too. Yeah, you know how to use your challenge. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, China, what will you change? Five seconds. Nothing. Nothing. You like, I like it the way it is? This right now. Too many changes, yes. Uh, let's enjoy us this right now. I will Liverpool. change the Liverpool offside. I will change the offside rules. If your hand as a player is ahead of the opposition, that's not an offside because there is nothing your hand does in the run of play. It doesn't do anything. Your hand will not play the ball. Your hand will not touch the ball, and then it be counted as a goal. That I will change to say that somebody is marginally offside because of the tip of his finger or the hand. Finger, the whole yeah. hand is in an outside position. It doesn't make sense to me. It is football. Well, it's on that note that we'll wrap up today's edition.